welcome to sections 2.29, 30, and 31. So we're going to kind of wrap up aerobic respiration with the electron transport chain, or electron transport system is the other common term. Uh, we're then going to cover fermentation, which is really the second half of anaerobic respiration, because we already covered glycolysis, that's the first half of it. And then we're going to do just a little bit of overview on anaerobic versus aerobic to kind of tie things up. And then that's it for cellular respiration, at least for now. Uh, we'll be able to wrap it up to have a test on Monday, so make sure you're getting prepared here and looking over your materials. This container, jug, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, this is here because this is strawberry wine, which is fermenting. Uh, you can see kind of the foam, so this will have yeast in it. You'll notice it's sealed up at the top, and so that means there's not oxygen, which forces it to do anaerobic respiration, which would be glycolysis followed by fermentation. And the yeast, when they ferment, produce alcohol as a byproduct, or ethanol, or ethyl alcohol, they might call it. Uh, and so ultimately, this is how you make strawberry wine. I've never tasted it, but I have heard about it in songs, and apparently it's delicious. All right. So finishing up our aerobic stuff first. At this point, we've talked about glycolysis, which occurs in the cytosol, and Krebs, which occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, which we've said is this you know, middlemost part. So we're now going to move to the Criste, which the Criste is, draw a little arrow here, is going to be right there, that membrane, that folded up membrane. And the reason for those folds is it increases the surface area. So it allows us to embed more electron transport chains than we would if it was just a straight membrane. So it kind of increases our efficiency. And so this process is going to use all these energy molecules that we talked about that we said we can't use right away. ATP, that's a finished product. You can use ATP just about anywhere in the cell. But when you get NADH or FADH2, these guys, they're not as universally useful. You have to have like the right machine. So it's kind of like me giving you Chuck E. Cheese money where you can only use it at Chuck E. Cheese. It's not universal like ATP. So for us to use this, we have to have the right equipment. And the right equipment for NADH and FADH2 to get energy from them is the electron transport chain. So these guys are going to go to this electron transport chain and the electron transport chain is going to be embedded in the criste. It's going to be a series of proteins that you'll see kind of in a row, kind of like photosystems. And the electrons will get dumped onto them. And the electrons will essentially move through these. And I like to show them moving down because what happens is the energy from the electrons is extracted. So we're going to do a process called chemiosmosis. That's what this is called. And so the electrons have energy. And the energy from the electrons will be shifted as they go down these electron transport chain, these proteins. Each protein releases some and will pump H plus out. So the H plus, H plus is going to be pumped from the matrix into this what they call intermembrane space, this space right here in between the two membranes. And so by using the energy from the electrons, I like the slide idea, you know, the electrons initially have a lot of energy and then they drop down. So by using that energy, they're able to pump these H pluses to make an H plus gradient, just like we had during photosynthesis, during the photosystems. So now we've got this H plus gradient, and the H plus gradient, if we let it diffuse, if we let the gradient try to go to equilibrium, which is spread out, you're going to see that the H pluses, which are currently kind of in the middle here, H plus, H plus, they're not perfectly in the middle, but close enough as I can draw, they want to go in. So if we allow these guys to go in to the matrix, that allows us to spin ATP synthase, that enzyme we talked about, and make ATP. So the H plus gradient is what will power ATP creation, specifically by that guy ATP, and I'll just write it here, synthase. That's what allows us to build ATP. So the ETC is all about extracting the energy, because once you use these guys up, once I take the energy from NADH, I have removed its electrons and an H+. Plus. So NADH is now going to become NAD+, plus and go back to the Krebs cycle or glycolysis to get recharged, to get electrons re-added and an H+, re-added to become NADH. FADH2 is going to essentially become FAD, so it's going to go back to get hydrogen ions and electrons added to it, and the cycle continues. So NADH and FADH2 are part of their own mini-cycles, where glycolysis and Krebs build them, the ETC breaks them apart, takes their electrons, converts the energy of electrons to an H plus gradient, and the H plus gradient into ATP. The whole process is called chemiosmosis, and the physical structure we call the electron transport chain that does this. 
Now, I do want to bring up one last thing about the electron transport chain, other than it's awesome, makes a ton of energy. If you remember, we have 10 NADHs that we produced during glycolysis, two, and Krebs, eight, and we had two FADH2s. So remember, each NADH gives us enough for three ATP, enough energy. Each FADH2 gives us enough for two. So we have a total of 30 plus this, so 34 ATP that we make just during the electron transport chain. So I want you to realize the electron transport chain produces a ton of ATP, way more than glycolysis 2, way more than Krebs 2. This is where the vast majority comes from. But for us to do the electron transport chain, we need oxygen. And the reason we need oxygen is as these electrons go through this chain, when they reach the end of it, someone's got to get them to go away someone has to pull it off the last molecule in that chain so that the next guy can go. So I like to think of this where if you have a slide and you've got somebody just sitting there at the end, like some big kid just sitting at the end, it prevents everybody else from using the slide. And so we have to have somebody to get that kid out of there. That somebody is oxygen. So oxygen is going to go and it's going to grab some H pluses and it's going to grab the electrons from the end of this chain and it's going to make water. So we'll see oxygen is normally referred to, let me draw a little arrow, it'll be called the final electron acceptor. Because it's the one who accepts, who takes that electron from the end of the electron transport chain so the next electron can go, and then takes that electron so the next one can go. If you run out of oxygen, that electron just sits there, and the electron transport chain, transport chain shuts down until it can be removed. This is why if you don't have oxygen, we can't do the ETC and we don't do Krebs. Because we already said the Krebs cycle is important because it gets rid of these molecules, these NADHs and FADH2s. Because I can't have a ton of NADH. It's a bad thing. Because when I do glycolysis, I need NAD+. If all my NAD+, ends up as NADH, I'm in trouble. So we only do Krebs to make a bunch of NADH and FADH2 if we have the electron transport chain functioning. And that only functions if there's oxygen present because oxygen's the final electron acceptor. It gets that electron out of there so the next one can go and the process can continue. So that wraps up aerobic respiration. You know, we have CO2 now is what our sugars become. We have water is what oxygen has become with the electrons. All of our energy molecules besides ATP have been reverted back to their original form so they can be reused, rebuilt. And what we're left with is a bunch of ATP. In this case, the total amount of ATP that we've made will be 38. That's our magic number of aerobic. The max ATP you can make is 38 ATP. So I'd kind of drawn this, but you've got these series of proteins here. This series of proteins, they're called cytochromes if you want to get fancy. Uh, they're the ones that will accept the electrons. You can see NADH is becoming NAD plus by dropping off these electrons, these two electrons. And those electrons will go through the electron transport chain. And you can see here at the end, oxygen is going to grab them. And it becomes water in the process. But as these electrons move, you can see it's pumping these H pluses out. So we have a whole bunch of H pluses in this middle section, this intermembrane space as they call it. And so if we then allow the H pluses to come in, which is what you see here through ATP synthase, that's what lets us build ATP. So this just shows you how these are embedded in this cristae, although it's not shown folded here like it would be. You can see that this works out nicely because most of these molecules being built, like NADH, are occurring by the Krebs cycle, which is just, just inside. It's basically touching uh, the electron transport chains. So the molecules that we need to do this process are right there. But this is the process that will occur. So that one's just a nice visual. Sorry about that. Should have jumped to that first. Now, fermentation is going to be the second part, so we'll kind of put a two here. This is the second part of anaerobic respiration, and it only has one purpose. If we want to keep doing glycolysis, to do glycolysis, I need NAD+, so I can convert it to NADH. You can see here, during this process of glycolysis, this is glycolysis up top here. So during this process of glycolysis, I get to make ATP, and I make NADH. If I kept doing this, eventually all my NAD plus would be NADH, so glycolysis would stop occurring. It couldn't happen. So the only purpose of fermentation is to convert the NADH that we made to NAD plus so glycolysis can continue. So we're essentially breaking down NADH, you can see the arrow here, we're breaking it down to make it go back to be NAD plus. 
So down here you can see this is the fermentation part. And so this bottom part is showing alcohol fermentation, but it's similar to lactic acid. And all it's doing, you'll see there's no ATP, there's nothing else really magical happening. We're just converting NADH to NAD+, so we can keep doing glycolysis. No ATP is made, and this is occurring in the, in the cytosol. There's nothing fancy. In the process of doing fermentation, though, pyruvate, the guy we ended up with, will be converted to something else. In this case, you're seeing pyruvate is converted to ethanol, with it, which is alcohol or ethyl alcohol. Uh, so this would be called alcohol fermentation. The other type of fermentation produces lactate. Otherwise, you'll see it called lactic acid. Same thing. And we, our muscle cells, can do lactic acid fermentation if we find ourselves running out of oxygen, like doing severe exercise. You don't want to be chased by a bear, and you're running really fast, and suddenly your ATP gets used up, and we don't have enough oxygen to make a bunch more, and you just fall down. You know, that's a good way to get killed. And so instead, our muscles and some of our high energy cells can rely on lactic acid fermentation to still get that two ATP. And then later on, what we tend to do is invest some energy to convert the lactic acid back to pyruvate and continue aerobic so we can get our energy back. But while we're short of oxygen, while you're breathing hard because you need oxygen, we're still able to live by doing lactic acid fermentation. We do not do ethanol or alcohol fermentation. If we did, you would not be able to jog or do like a marathon because halfway through you'd probably be like stone drunk stumbling around because you'd start to do fermentation, you'd produce a bunch of alcohol, and bad things would happen. So we do lactic acid fermentation, not ethanol fermentation. But you'll see both of them in this graphic, same thing. Both types of fermentation are going to convert NADH to NAD+. Same thing. Both of them are still going to do glycolysis. That's the energy part. But doing glycolysis is the only energy part. The rest of it's just whichever way you want to pick, lactic acid or ethanol, whichever way you need to, to make sure that you regenerate your NADH to become NAD+, so you can continue doing it. That's it. That's anaerobic respiration. That's fermentation. So lastly, before I completely wrap things up, I just want to make sure we're clear, anaerobic respiration does have some advantages. It doesn't need oxygen, so especially in the early Earth environment where there was no oxygen, you could still do this. And that's a big plus. Everybody would be dead at this point if that didn't happen. The other benefit, it is faster. So if you're trying to use a lot of energy, like we just said, if you're running, you tend to run out of oxygen. We can't get enough of it. But this still allows us to get rapid energy. So th that's one of the bonuses of this if you need some quick energy, although we can't use it all the time. Otherwise, lactic acid or alcohol would build up, and that can become a problem. It's not like an OK thing to have a ton of it. But at least short term, this is useful. And remember, it does not produce much ATP. That's its big downside. So aerobic respiration is slower, but it produces way more ATP, 19 times roughly more ATP. And right now, it's really good because we have an atmosphere that's about 21% oxygen. So if you're living in today's world, or even a couple hundred million years back world, it's a great thing to do because oxygen is plentiful. So it's not that hard to get enough of it to make sure you can reliably perform aerobic respiration. If we were talking 3 billion years ago, completely different story. It wouldn't have been oxygen. You'd have had to have been anaerobic. That's it for cell respiration, guys. We'll go through some more of it in class to make sure you get it. But I hope you've enjoyed this.